Ladies and gentlemen, we uh, had started last time. It was interrupted by uh, the important priority of, of uh, the stakeholders coming in to, to present. Um, we had talked about a variety of best practices. I had started to introduce uh, some. And I'm going to be going, again, continuing on a whirlwind tour through these best practices um, and, and telling you what's expected of you but also giving you some pointers to what um, I'd really advise you to, uh, to understand about these uh, for your projects. It turns out this material is very important for the final exam as well. So this is kind of a sneak preview for major topics in the final. Um, the following slides really boil down my some of my most core recommendations for software in a way that needs to be enacted during the semester and will be tested on the final exam and on pop quizzes. So if you, if you study this material, you'll get a, a pretty good sense as to what I consider the most important in this class. Okay? So it's advised to, to pay attention for that reason. So I noted a set of best practices which have evolved in industry um, over many decades to support software projects. Some of these best practices are things in common with other spheres of project management, areas as diverse as civil engineering projects, um, uh, projects involving uh, mechanical engineering, etc. But um, many of them are adapted, almost all of them are strongly adapted to, and many of them are specific to software engineering. Okay? Um, but I'm going to be covering some that you'll find in general project management textbooks uh, as well. And I'm going to be going through a number of these that I really want to get to you as forcefully as possible in these early days. The one we started with last time was talking about accountable positions. And I noted that in the project here, I strongly recommend um, uh, thinking about uh, positions listed here. And I've shown in bold positions which uh, need to be addressed in the project, okay? And those include the project manager, a uh, sort of a, a coordination, facilitation a role, someone who makes sure things don't fall through the cracks, work doesn't get duplicated, work is, is, is divvied up, et cetera, um, who handles the communication with the client. That's not to say they're the only person meeting with the client, it's just they're always there with the client. They're the one who make sure they're on the same page for the client and serves as the point of contact for the client to the team. Form principle for software engineering. Beyond this class, you should have a project manager who, or some other position specifically devoted or specifically taking responsibility for the one point of contact with the client. Don't have a client working directly with the developer. Very important principle. Why not have the client work directly with the developers? You might think that it makes it a more egalitarian thing. The developers talk directly, clarify things for the stakeholders. You might think that's efficient. Why not? The client doesn't have to repeat themselves. Exactly. That's one big issue. It's one big issue. The project manager, the point of contact, is going to be the one who has the kind of canonical understanding of the client's needs and keeps track of them and make sure they're reflected, say, in a requirements document, some updated record of what the client wants that can be spread around the team, rather than repeated by the client to some people and not to others who don't know about it. So by coming into the project manager, they can disseminate. What other reasons might there be? Well, often the project manager, not for this class, but often the project manager will be in charge also of financial issues. So, if, if their project's going to make a commitment to develop a feature, typically it has financial implications. And the project manager is the one who would solicit understanding how much work this is going to take and tell that to the client. Meanwhile, the developers don't want to be burdened with that. They don't, they don't know how much this is going to cost. They can't be the one making that decision. It's a project management decision, which requires consulting with often a set of different people. It requires knowing, after we deliver for this client, what's next? Who else do we have to deliver for? 
Um, what other competing responsibilities do they have? The average developer is not going to have that. Another issue is the developers generally keep their developers, testers, they're involved in the operational delivery of the work. They're the ones thinking about how do we actually accomplish this. And to distract them with dealing with the client is often problematic because they get badgered by a client to add a feature and may, may just do it without, just to get the client off their back to the detriment of the rest of the project. I've been in that situation before where I've, I'm a developer, a client pushes me, and I finally say, well, what the heck, sure, I'll <laughs> just, I don't have to speak, you know, be bothered by you anymore. And that doesn't get reflected in the budget, it doesn't get reflected in the schedule, it doesn't get reflected in other people's knowledge and commitments. So project manager, having a single point of project management is very important. Not in the sense they're ordering everyone around, but in the sense that they're there to make sure the project goes smoothly and there's this coordinated effort that involves others. A risk officer is important. This is not a full-time position. And in a team your size, I might actually think, I say this with caution, but in a team your size, with fewer people to coordinate than a 10-person team or a 12-person team like we commonly deal with in this class, you might think about the project manager taking responsibility for risk management as well. That's a possibility, okay? Um, because often the project manager's responsibility is to grow at least linearly with the number of people in the team. You have to find common meeting times that work with everyone. You need to email people, keep people in sync, etc. And it's going to be a smaller project. It's going to be a project with fewer people involved. And so the risk, off the risk officer duties might be folded into a project management for a team of your size. For a larger team, I'd never recommend that. Yep. Um, I have a question. Dude. So is the project manager um, responsible for the deciding which features to implement in the project then? Uh, the project manager will be the one who makes the final cut on that. In other words, they'll be the one who commits to the client about what thing we're doing, what thing we're not. Okay? They're going to be the one often hearing from the client the prioritization, the level of need. The others might be there. The project manager must be there okay? because they're the, they're the, the central point of contact. Um, and, and as such, they're going to be the final call. Now, a good project manager will lead not by um, by ordering people around in an authoritarian way. They'll lead by a sort of um, uh, a, a, a softer sense of authority, a kind of uh, um, authority that comes from being reasonable, listening to many people, um, listening to different voices, and reflecting them in their decision, and, and talking if they couldn't make a decision per the request, say, of the developer, um, explaining why. Um, it doesn't seem to be best for the project. So they have to make their case with the team. They have to interact with the team enough to spread around their knowledge. Um, so they typically won't make a decision in isolation of the team members. They need to listen. How much work is this going to take from a developer's perspective? How, how good is the testing on this place? How much testing will we need more to really make this feature robust? Um, they need to be consultative. But at the end of the day, they're going to be the one who has to make the hard call, do we do this or not. Does that make sense, Drew? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, so, so the project manager is balancing what they're hearing from multiple people, trying to make sense of it and decide. You folks are spared a lot of grief. The project manager, whoever turns out to be the project manager on your team is going to be spared a lot of grief. On 10 to 12 person teams, a lot of what project managers deal with is the discoordination of different people across the team. The fact that this person's been sick and doesn't know about these updates from the client. This other person came in late and doesn't know about these technologies. This other person has gone AWOL. They disappeared without communicating. Or these two people don't get along together you know, within the development team and they're fighting and project manager has to step in and mediate that. And a team your size is better for that. It's, it's actually easier. And um, I wouldn't be horribly surprised if 
your team is actually more productive than some teams twice your size. Because there's just less, there's fewer heads with different ideas about what's going on and fewer heads budding. Not to make it sound horrible, normal semester. It, it, there's a lot more drama with big teams, or considerably more. Okay, development, there needs to be a development lead, someone who takes ownership of, of what tasks need to be done. Does that mean one person with their hands on the keyboard doing the development? No. I would not recommend that to the product manager. They should not be involved in going in and adding features. That's too much, too much for them to worry about. But a project manager, there needs to be someone who takes ownership on this side. When I say take ownership, they take responsibility. They're accountable. They're, they're the one who, at the end of the day, makes sure that in terms of development tasks, Things don't fall through the cracks, things aren't duplicated, work is divvied up, work gets done in time compatible with what's planned, or they notify the project manager ahead of time if they're not going to be able to meet a deadline. You know, we, we thought we could hit this, it turned out to be more complicated, these two technologies didn't play well together, and I don't think we're going to hit it. Telling the project manager that ahead of time and move the risk officer so that you know, backup plans can be made, contingency what do we do if this feature doesn't get developed in time? Okay, can you, there needs to be a build master, someone who takes responsibility for the build. This is, we're gonna talk about this later in, the, in, the, in this lecture. What's going on in the build? What is this build thing? Basically, it's, it includes a whole variety of tasks, compilation, smoke testing, maybe a set of other tasks, style checking, deployment, eventually containerization, um, uh, deployment to developer machines, uh, recreation of the database, etc. And there needs to be someone taking advantage of testing. If there's one thing that distinguishes this class from most other classes you will have taken, I do require a lot of testing. Testing in different forms. Manual? Yeah. Do some manual exploratory testing. It's great. You discover things you wouldn't have otherwise. Bug parties for manual testing jointly? Awesome. Awesome power. Do, do testing of it together manually. But not just manual, automated. And by automated, I mean some tests, I talked to Jesse about it earlier, some tests that run through the user interface. Think of it as like you have a robot that really quickly presses submit and fills in forms and you know picks things from drop downs and, and interacts with your application or on Android or iPhone. And, you know, acting like a user would, pressing through the user interface. And then other tests that just make calls to the underlying functions that would be called by the user interface, but doesn't actually need to go through the user interface. These are what are called system tests, okay? They're testing not just one feature, but a couple features working together. And they need to be done in addition to unit tests. So a lot of what this class is about is doing good testing. And I'm gonna have many lectures about how to do that testing, how to plan your test cases, how to plan them judiciously to accomplish the greatest confidence building in your application, to discover more errors. But because of this, there needs to be someone taking responsibility for testing. Okay? Um, and uh, there, in a larger project, would be several testers. Now, in this case, we've got five people, right? Okay, maybe someone else will roll in. Maybe someone else will roll out. Um, hopefully not. But we've got one, two, three, four, five. Which is not a bad match. Now, what, what, what are the needs or good matches or what are the sort of core competencies, the features which each of these might need? I put this in for you guys. I thought I'd be able to put Okay, I need to put it in the slide because you don't have 12 people to pick from. You have five, and you have five decisions. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta think about who's gonna do what by some way better than picking straws. Uh -huh. do that, but it's probably not a great one. Okay, project manager, this should be someone who at least likes dealing some with people. Uh, so, so it helps if they're a bit extroverted, it helps if they, they enjoy it, or at least they're not averse to it. 
They should have decent people skills in the sense of being able to, to work with the, a team. They should be interested in coordination. They should have some measure of patience. I mean, just, okay, are things getting done? What's getting done? What do I not know about the project that I need to know to know where it's at? And uh, having a commitment to a certain amount of detail, are things lining up for this deliverable? The deliverables in this class are not two months apart. They are two or three weeks apart. And what that means is you've got to be pretty careful along the way of saying, okay, what exactly are we doing? What things are falling into place? Why are they two or three weeks apart? Well, one major reason is it's a lot easier to estimate how long things will take. If, if you only have two weeks to do it. You start to think like, oh, well, next week I've got final in history. I have an essay due in English. I'm probably out for those four days just studying and getting ready for that. So realistically, the amount I can accomplish in two weeks is lower than I might otherwise think. You think in concrete terms, and you think in terms of what I have to do in terms of tasks. If I ask you to plan out what you're going to do in three months' time, it's really easy to fool yourself. To do something, oh, you know, I, I'm a good developer. I could probably do that. Um, but it's really, it's really not based on concrete thinking through what needs to be done. It's harder to fool yourself if you think about two weeks from now rather than a longer time. And, as we'll see, it has lots of other benefits for the stakeholders and for you. Learning what to do next, uh, the stakeholder thinking through their needs better, um, from looking at something, um, being able to always have something in hand, etc. Now, the risk manager. They should be someone who, who has a certain amount of patience for thinking through what could go wrong. That's what I mean by scenarios. What, 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 what could really go awry? Like where are we vulnerable um, uh, to hacking, to someone dropping, to someone getting sick, to um, you know, the tech staff not being available, to um, technologies working together? Kind of interested in investigating uh, possibilities. And they need to talk basically to everyone on the team. They should be going, let's suppose Jesse were a risk manager. They need to go to each of you folks um, and, and basically talk about, you know, are you worried about any aspect of the project? What things keep you awake at night now? Or what things, are, or what things do you think could go wrong? in your project. What are you worried about in terms of how things could go? And doing that on a regular basis. And they should be looking, if already ambition risks have come up, or are coming up, or uh, this material risks that are coming, and they're, they're, they're coming about, or you want to talk about new types of risks. So a risk manager is an important position. One of the worst, it's one of the worst ways teams like this can fail. One of the worst ways you can have failure in your, in your projects is where things are just humming along and you forget about a risk. You forget about this. So someone drops a class unexpectedly. Or your developer, your lead developer, has to go to the programming contest. Because they won, they won the regionals and now they have to go national. They didn't know they have to, except they won. Um, or, you know, um, a hacker breaks into your system because you're using a weak password. Or these two technologies you thought worked together, you discover for deliverable three, they don't play together once you start implementing this feature. And you get hit on the head, and things seem to be going great, and suddenly you've got a deadline in a week, and you might not be able to deliver. It's a horrible feeling. And it's a feeling that can be averted by Appropriately putting in place plans earlier or mitigation. So, for example, you do a thorough evaluation of how well these technologies play together across a variety of ways. Or you have a backup person that you can call when the dev lead is gone. You have someone else who knows the code base who can step in for a lot of that. Instead of the, the dev lead being the only person who knows the code base, etc. So shadowing people, spreading knowledge via tutorials, spreading knowledge via care programming, or via uh, inspections and peer review, these are all good ways to avoid that. Okay, um, so risk manager is really important. Now build master. Build master should, 
at least tolerate and sometimes be interested in configuration of systems. Um, a build master is responsible for making sure that the GitHub pipeline is set up for the project and evolves with the project. By evolving with the project, I mean over time, well, what's, what's going to be neat? Imagine development's going on and it's being checked into the, uh, it's being checked into the repo, the, the repository. What, what about what a build's doing needs to evolve with that? If the code base is growing over time, what things need to grow with the code base or, or be changed with the code base? Good. Yeah, absolutely. So any build-related scripts or information dependencies or what depends on what? Excellent. Dude. What other things might need to evolve with the with the with the code base? Uh, if you said drivers. Libraries. Libraries. Yeah, the libraries used. Excellent. Mod. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, potentially yes. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, good. So, so yeah, libraries. What are the what are the things? Projector or why? How about the database schema? What's stored in the database? You add a new feature, and suddenly you have to store more information in the database related to that feature. Right? You you allow people to share documents. You need to now maintain okay who has access to that document and what capacity. So you have to add changes to the schema, those need to evolve with it. So the database structure um, needs to evolve with that. And you have to recreate the database with a new structure. What else? I'll, I'll give you a hint. It begins with T. It ends with T. Testing. Test, yeah, test. Test a bunch of features as if the user is using the system um, to test basically that it works, so people can at least log in or something. That needs to evolve. So the build master is one of these positions. They're busy during the term. Build master and risk manager aren't that busy around deliverables. They're not extra busy around deliverables. I'll put it that way. It's not like they're they have to crush in their job responsibilities to do the deliverable. Maybe they have to write it up, but that so they're doing stuff pretty much through the semester. The dev lead, that's pretty spiky. You know, it, it involves a lot of work and then hand off to the test team and, and some further work. Someone on the dev team, they need to have a commitment and an interest in software development. They need to like developing software. Now, I like to think that most people who are in the software engineering honors program actually like writing software. But some people well, some people have this passion for it. Others might be more interested in designing it or the UI side or, or testing it. And there's those are absolutely essential things. But the, definitely it should be someone who really enjoys writing code and writing unit tests along with that code. A test lead Okay, test, testing is a specialty. Testing is not a, is not for would-be developers who can't make the cut. Testing is its own specialty. Good testers are different from good developers. Good testers can break software in a way that good developers can't. There's a team at IBM, it's called the Black Team. Um, and the black team was famous for being able to crush software. And they had a reputation, it was a somewhat, it was a somewhat malevolent reputation, a malicious reputation. Like you would bring your code to submit to them for testing. And you know, they have a test machine set up and they'd put it on there. And they'd sort of, when they take it, they'd sort of play out to the suspense tackle at you and they will roll up their sleeves and within five minutes they could bomb you if you crash your software. Yeah. Just going straight away. And and it had a bad reputation of making people cry sometimes because you know they, they've been working at this for or uh, the last month and they're really proud of the code and we'll, we'll crush it. And you know they crush it like a tin can within three minutes, you know, boom, dead. Um, I'm not asking you to do that. You know, I'm not asking for you to cat call when people give it to you, the test lead. But the test lead, ladies and gentlemen, should enjoy 
by really putting software through a ringer and, and, and testing, is this thing working? Not just sympathetically. Developers test their code sympathetically. What are you guys sympathetically when they test their code? Okay, yeah, so they write the test after the code. That's often a clue. And what are they hoping when they write those tests? That the test goes through. Yeah, the test passes. And often what they do is psychologically. Lots of studies have been done on testing. And one thing that comes out is psychologically, developers hope that their code passes the test. And they're kind of writing the code to demonstrate their code is working. Which is not, I mean, it's not a horrible thing to do. It's better than not writing a test at all, right? But, but a good tester will find ways to really see, I'm going to try to make this program fail. And they're thinking in ways, I'm going to try to see if I can find a way this program will fail. And that's a different mindset than just saying, oh, look, it works with common cases. You know, I'll put in a couple of names, oh, yeah, it's going to be working. It's, it's looking for those nasty cases. You know, like some people have accents in their name, right? <laughs> or they... They have names, like the last name that has two parts, D'Angelo, you know, it's two different words, or it's an apostrophe in it, or something like that. And the developer didn't think to put that in, and when they wrote the test, they might not think to test it because it's not a common name. The developer is trying to show that it works. The tester tries to say, how can I make this fail? And that takes a certain mindset. And a good tester can be many, many times better at testing than a good developer. Yeah, mom. Well. Do the tester look at the code or do they just test? No. They basically, this is a very good question. Developers in this class, as in the industry, are expected to do some testing. What sort of testing would a developer do? They write a certain type of test. It's called a white box. White box? Yeah, it's often a white box test, and it's a unit test, meaning they're writing it for their little piece. They, they're about to write some code. This is test driven development, and they write some tests for you know, what correct functioning code will do for that piece. But ladies and gentlemen, that's a, that is a key thing. Testing the pieces is key, these unit tests. But it's not everything, because the pieces can be fine, but the system as a whole doesn't work. How could that be? How could a piece be fine in isolation if the system doesn't work? Because one piece might work, but when you put the pieces together, it might work. Yes. Because each of these pieces might have been perfectly reasonable assumptions, <laughs> but they're different assumptions, right? Um, one, one of them thinks a two for a status code means, you know, the network was disconnected. The other thing that means a disco, right? <laughs> and they're not working together well. That's not a particularly good example, but the point is they, they, they might each be perfectly reasonable. But each thought the other was going to implement something. Each thought the other was going to handle the error condition. And neither handles it. So each looks good according to its spec, but they're, they don't do the whole thing because they don't completely handle the situations. Uh, so you need something more than unit tests. Unit tests are written by developers. Man, if I keep this up, the whole. Um, but testers, these dedicated testers, what they will handle is not unit tests, but system tests, and some integration tests, which are sort of different pieces working together. But a lot of it is system tests. Maybe through the UI, they'll use systems like Selenium, for example, or JRobot, which actually, again, it's, it's like they're a fake user, so they'll, you know, be manipulating a browser and clicking things and filling things in and submitting and all that sort of stuff or on an Android device or what have you. Um, there's a whole swack of these different systems depending on whether you do a web app or a, whether you do an Android or iOS. Those are system tests through the UI. And then there's some system tests which don't use the UI. They just make the calls, the underlying methods that the UI would call. And the testers are the ones who write those sort of tests. Devs? They write unit tests, and they write the code. Testers write the broader tests and run the broader tests. And testers are the ones who typically do the manual testing, in addition to any bug parties you do. 
Do bug parties early, do bug parties often, just like peer review teams. The teams, once they do them, say, oh my god, this is crap. Do them early, because often they do them like the last little deliverable. It's a big mistake. Do, do one for earlier deliverables, too. They're, they're really fun. Who can find the most bugs? What's the most interesting bug found? You get ideas from one another, etc. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, accountable positions. These are some suggestions about characteristics. I'm glad to talk more about that. Any, any questions about that before I go on? Yeah, yeah, Jude. I have a question about testing leads. Um, yeah. Is there a, like, some kind of guidelines to the testers can use to, for them to make We're going to, th thanks for the question. There's some, th there's some techniques I'll be teaching specifically in class to help reason about how thorough are our tests and where are they falling short. Two of, three of the major ways, I'll just list them, and you can actually find videos of me talking online about these things, okay, from test 371s. Um, number one, there's a thing called a test matrix, and what it provides is, the basic idea is, by the way, this is like a very common thing to see in the final exam. So this is again like the greatest hits of this class. This is like a long review session, this class and next class, where I talk about the most important things, right? So here, what we'll often have is, and it varies which axis they're on, but this will be like test cases up here. And this will be features here. Okay, um, on the y-axis, and for each test case, call this test case one, test case two. Each of these is a very particular thing. You, you do this with the system. You enter this input. You press this. You next do this. It's a very well defined test case. It's like you're you're driving the system in a very specific way with specific input, so it's reproducible. It's it's really defined exactly what you do. And you're indicating here which features of the system are tested by this, right? It tests document open, and it tests, you know, searching in the document and closing the document or something like that. This test here, maybe it tests, you know, um, uh, deleting text and inserting text or something like that, but on an already open document. Well, maybe it does document open as well. And the point is, this gets you to spot per Jude's comment, which are the, how would we know if the tests were, what would warn us that the tests here are, are, are not very complete? If we saw something, what would warn us that the tests collectively are not that complete? What, 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 if, we, what if we saw, how would we know the tests aren't complete? Yeah. Untested feature? Sorry? Untested feature. Yeah, exactly, an untested feature, precisely. So if there were a row here, and if I had, presence of thought, it, I would have thought to, to include that. If there's a row where there's no check, that means there's no test which tests that. Do you see that? Yeah, so that's a very useful construct. These could be features, these might also be requirements from the user, like, like needs from the user. Um, it might be other aspects that aren't features, but they're type of functionality. You know, like for example, connectivity to a remote system. So when the database is on a remote system and it has to communicate under the wires, it's not a, it's not, I wouldn't think of it as a feature necessarily, it's not like something the user can push, but it's something that, that is, is part of the system that accomplishes a certain task. Does that make sense? Um, and test cases can capture that. There's another thing called path testing, okay, where you're actually reasoning about the possible pathways through the system in terms of things that you're doing to accomplish things. And you want to have a set of tests which cover those paths, you know, which kind of an error condition here, or respond to it here, and, and do that, or another one where there's no error that comes up, et cetera. So you have these different possibilities in accomplishing tasks with the system. And you can depict those visually as a, as a network. You know, I don't look like Mark Pyle, but if you could map back or page me, you know, 20 years or something, you, you might think of me as Mark Pyle. And, and if you took Mark Pyle's course, uh, did, you, did you take 360 from 
want to talk? Okay. Um, so he would have taught you about networks. Yeah. So about, about like network flow diagrams and so on. You could think of it as creating a diagram like that for how the system goes from, from one state to another, from one feature to another. So I'm on this page of the Android app with the screen and I press this button and it takes me to this other screen and then I enter this and it takes me to this other screen. Um, those same algorithms that Mark teaches exceptionally well, and he's someone I, I, I think of amazingly as a teacher, he, uh, those same, some of those same algorithms um, can be applied here to reason about like uh, how can you get from one feature to another? And by looking at which of those paths have been tested in a network diagram, you can spot, are we missing tests? Are there things we, you know, transitions we aren't just, we aren't covering? Or are there states, like an error state, which we're not covering, where, you know, the network's disconnected and it needs to operate offline. You know, and I, I have these cards, showing my contacts and I'm offline right now and the app still needs to work even though I can't get load the cards from the server or something like that, okay? Um, and there's a third type, um, a third set of things we can do as well to, to, spot, um, to spot completeness in testing. Um, and and it's, it involves bug par simultaneous bug parties um, and what's called pooling to discover when we have a large number of undiagnosed defects that we haven't caught. There's actually ways, believe it or not, not only keeping track of how many defects you have caught, but trying to estimate how many defects out there you haven't caught. Okay, and I'll be talking about those in class. Okay. Great question. Any other questions related to this? This is awesome. I like these discussions and I like questions. Okay. Um, okay. So let's talk about risk management. I I, I started on this last time a little bit. Motivation here is twofold. Number one, today's risk is tomorrow's problem. If we don't handle it, it's going to be a problem tomorrow. If we don't aggressively attack risks, they'll aggressively attack us. That's a common one process. But conversely, today's problem is tomorrow's risk. What that means is if we've learned from experience, if we encounter a problem, we can often say, okay, we've got to scan for this problem in the future. If, if we stumbled over something, then we can try to watch out for it in the future. Hopefully we can learn something, all right? Um, oh, it's Weinberg, not Tom DeMarco. I hashed them to the same bucket. Okay, so good risk, and, and this is a key point, ladies and gentlemen. Risk management is not just about preventing yourself from getting in really bad scrapes. Good risk management, good ability to handle uncertainties in software development is what allows a really good company to work on the cutting edge successfully. Because if you don't do that, there's so many risks, uncertainties at the cutting edge, that you'll typically fail. But if you do good risk management, you can thrive by being the first, getting a so-called first mover advantage, being the first in a new area, developing a new type of software that's cutting edge technology. And that allows you to, to be paid really well. You're the first in a certain new area of the market. You can get really well paid for that, really well compensated, because there's few competitors. If you're doing same old, same old types of apps that lots of companies can develop, you're not going to be able to, to do as well financially, because you'll be a commodity. You'll be interchangeable with them. It'll be you know, lots of competition that can undercut you. But if you can work at the cutting edge, not only is it more interesting intellectually, but it's, it rewards you better. But to do that, you have to be able to handle the risks. You have to be able to detect risks ahead of time. Because those are where big uncertainties are. No one's done it before, so you can't go read about it online everywhere. You're facing uncertainties. Does this technology work with that one? No one's done it. You can't find things online. So you have to be able to handle those risks. If you can handle them well, that's what allows you to succeed at the covenant, and that's what allows you to be paid really well. So Google, one of the reasons it does really well is it can do effective risk management. It can manage these uncertainties, cut through them, and cut off things that are unpromising and put their energy into things that are promising and put their resources. So it allows avoiding many 
problems with resilience to problems that do come up, and it helps you budget time and money more effectively by avoiding going down rat holes that, that aren't going to work out for too long. Okay, um, so software classically is considered one of the riskiest types of business. Um, this is, if you look back over the decades, software projects fail at really good rates, historically. Very, very high rates. Um, I think it's something like, the statistics historically, but something like 40% of software projects fail. 40%? And they fail in different ways. Dostoevsky once said, maybe it was, maybe it was Tolstoy, one of those two Russians said, all happy families are happy in a similar way, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own unique way. Um, and with risks, there's a set of classic ways that things go wrong. And here are some of them. I'm going to come back to two unrealistic schedules, because who defines whether it's unrealistic? Um, it requires not just thinking about it, but Software development team agreeing to the schedule where maybe they, they feel more uh, misgivings and then being judged against it. Personnel short policy you don't have enough. Developing wrong software functions. The stakeholder's not happy. You misunderstand what they want. Wrong user interface. Uh, there's ongoing requirements changes from the, from the stakeholder, etc. Uh, so what do you want to do here? You want to identify the risks. You want to determine which of them are big risks. How much do these risks matter? And basically what you're going to do here is you're going to determine, at least roughly, low, medium, high, that's fine for this class, what's the probability of this happening, and what's the severity if it happens? Mark my word. The prioritization is going to come out of two things. How likely is it happening? That's the probability. Low, medium, high is what I'm asking you to think about. And how bad is it if it happens? Those are two different things, right? There might be something that's not too likely to happen. Maybe it's low probability to happen, but it's super bad if it happens. And you want to consider that a decent priority. Alternatively, there may be something very likely to happen, but it's only modest impact. That also should be treated seriously high chance of happening. If it's low chance of happening and low chance, low error, you know, no problem because of it, you don't need to handle it that, that seriously. So you've got to prioritize. Risk management is not about identifying every risk out there and enumerating them exhaustively and just saying, okay, we're thinking about all of them. It's about taking the ones that are most important as determined by this risk exposure, probability times impact severity if it happens. And it's and it involves saying, okay, look, for each risk, um, how are we going to react to it? If we just assume, we just say, look, we accept this. You know, um, we accept the fact that that it's possible that, you know, there could be a catastrophic fire that destroys Department of CS servers, or, you know, there's there's a loss of, of chronic to be some risk we accept. Um, some we can avoid by, by just using an entirely different strategy. Maybe there's a risk about when the new iOS version will come out, and we're worried about how it will affect our potential program there. So we just say, well, only develop for an Android program. It's an Android-specific product. We're not going to do iOS. We avoid that risk. But the two biggest things I want you to focus on are, the, are, are these. Mitigation, you take some action now, to either head it off, lessen its chance of happening, or make it much less likely to happen. So, sorry, much less likely to happen, or if it does happen, much less impactful, much less chance it will, it will have a bad impact. So that's mitigation. Contingency planning is different. Mark my words, these are the two things. These are like evidently examinable. Um, put gold stars next to them. I'd be surprised if the final exam does not ask about this. Okay. So, so mitigation, you try to avoid it happening, or you try to 
makes it less impactful if it does happen. The point is you're investing now to make it less of a problem. Hmm? You're taking action now. Contingency planning is different. All you're doing is you're putting in place a plan now. You're planning what you will do if it comes about. You said, okay, it may come out, but we're gonna have a plan. Why, why does it matter when you have a plan when it comes out? Who cares? Who cares if, that's, if you have a plan? Why, why do you care if you have a plan or not? Why does it matter? Yeah. Is it Sorry? So it doesn't like destroy the project. Yeah, you can still need the deadline, so you can act quick. And everyone's clear about what needs to be done. Okay, this comes about, okay, suppose that someone gets sick in our park. We know that whatever position they're in, we have a backup person for that position. Someone has been shadowing them, or someone has been doing pair work with them, someone has been briefed by them on an ongoing basis to take over. Okay, now that involves a little bit of work up front. I mean, you're having someone shadow them. But you have a convincing plan, if they get sick, they're not available, this person will step in. So you don't have to have a meeting, and you say, you know, who can do it, and you know, um, who knows enough about their work. Someone's been shouting them all along to, to, and they can just step in like that, and you know exactly who it is. Or, you know, you, you end up losing contact with the stakeholder. You have a plan for, okay, if we can't contact them for three days, you contact the instructor, and he'll reach out to them. Uh, or, you know, we'll undertake this action to escalate it to, to um, try to contact them in person or what have you. So you're all on the same page about what needs to be done and you can act immediately. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, those are the main two things I want you to know about. But this last thing, equally important. For the risk manager, this is absolutely central. You gotta monitor. Risk management is not something you do only in the first week. It's something you do throughout the time. You're monitoring. Is one of these risks we identified earlier coming about? Like, is this person coming in? Well, we haven't heard from them for two days. Maybe we haven't heard back from the stakeholder to, their, to our recent email. Maybe we should reach out to them again. This technology is acting flaky. Is it possible it's actually unreliable in this new context we're using it? You're kind of keeping your ear to the ground is one of these risks we already identified coming out, or identifying new risks. That's what's called risk scanning. Both of these are included. You're identifying earlier risks that are coming about, identified risks that are coming about, or, or uh, new risks that, um, types of risks that you didn't identify. I have extra slides in here. I'm providing all these slides to you. You can go and look at these about contingency planning, mitigation, etc. And as, as I noted, I expect a risk officer, risk scanning, an updated risk plan. Each deliverable, I'd like to see a risk plan. ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I'd like to see what are the top 10 risks right now. What's a risk that might change later in the semester? What's a risk that might go down later in the semester, typically? Uh, someone dropping? Yeah, someone dropping the class. Typically. Good, good and important risk. It's a risk that who's dropping? Very close to that. Um, what's another risk that might go down? People getting this year? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, you may be through the worst part of the semester, depending on the, on the course. How many of you are in 3 through 2? Um. at the end of the semester, I, I want you to tell me what went right and what went wrong. This is an important part of learning. I, I, I really value honesty in this. You know, what could we have done better? Where did we fall short? That's really good. It's not a, 
It's not something I'm going to punish you for. It's something I'm going to reward you for if you can learn from that. How could we have done this better? How do we do it again? That's actually a significant part of Mark, is being able to reflect on what's happened and ask how it could be done better. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a few others. Did you folks learn in 214, maybe, or um, maybe 370, uh, about use of assertions? A little bit, but not incredibly Okay, a, a little bit? Yeah. So, so, what's that? We use computer and browser. Awesome. Awesome. That's what I like to hear. Use them early, use them often, on an alpha basis. Oh, okay. So, so what's the job of an assertion? Why do, why do we put assertions in the program? It's like a sanity check of sorts. It's a sanity check. It checks my assumptions as a developer. It's like, I'm developing for this code. When I write code, I, I almost always use, have assumptions. What's an assumption I might make? Like, if I'm writing a method, what's an assumption I might make? Maybe it takes a couple arguments, it takes a couple form, it has a couple formal parameters. We pass some information to the arguments, maybe a reference to this object, and maybe uh, an integer that represents uh, an index and an array. What, what things might I write an assertion about? Uh, something is not null? Yeah, yeah, the reference is not null, the integer. Yeah, the integer is within a legal range, like it's no, it's no bigger than the size of the array minus one, and it's not negative. So these are assumptions that I'll typically have when I'm writing this code. What an assertion allows me to do is operationalize it. In other words, write something that will check them, right? Now, why would I do that? Yeah? Because it fails, you know exactly where it fails. I know exactly where it fails, and I'll know as, as early as possible. Let's suppose, so the assertion will actually stop the code, right? When it hits that, if it fails that assertion, it will let me know. If it didn't stop the code, let's suppose it continued on, it might get some distance later in the program before it fails, which makes it a lot harder to develop. Right? This actually catches the error often much closer to where the error originated. It catches it early in once you know. And one of the deadliest things is, and this is going to sound weird, if the program did crash. Why is that deadly? Why do I say that's deadly? Okay, so there's a there's a um, illegal, maybe it's an illegal index. Um, maybe index A, I has to be bigger than index J when it's fast to me, and it's not. Why, why is it deadly, I say, if it doesn't crash? Um, it, well, it compromises the whole system. Since it didn't crash, you could have easily assumed that there are like, more serious bugs in the system. That's right. Like, it may give me results that are gibberish. <laughs> They're nonsense. It might do something wrong, and I don't know about it. I, I can't spot it because it's too subtle, right? Maybe it's doing my income taxes, <laughs> and, and you know it screws up the income tax calculation. I want to know if it has an error. I want to know that, it's, that it encounters an error about my income tax because I don't want it to just put out gibberish like I owe my entire income, you know, to <laughs> to pay. That, that would not be good, right? Yeah. Okay, great question. An assertion is sanity test at one point in the code. Okay? A smoke test is testing, it's part of the bill, and it's testing that the, the system as a whole is basically working. Okay? When I say that basically, it's not testing all features, it, but it's basically, it's testing the basic features like can you log in? Can you undertake the most common tasks with it? And I'll tell you why that is later, if not this time, next time. But basically we want to make sure that when I check my code into the code base, I haven't closed all of you. I haven't screwed all of you up by checking code that screws up the whole system. Because if I check in code that basically breaks the system, you may not be working with my part of the system, but I suppose screwed it up, you're not able to continue your test or your development. Because you're 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 not even able to log in. You're not even, even able to open a file now because I've screwed that part up. And so if you discover that in a smoke test, a smoke test dude runs when I check my code here. And there's something that's just running every time that part of the code is read. A smoke test runs when I check my code in. And if it fails, we don't want you folks to get my code. Because my code would actually mark a backward step in code base. It would actually deprive you of being able to do your work. So we actually use a failed smoke test to say, roll back the latest commit. It 
undo my latest check in so I can go back and fix what I've done because it will be a backward step for the system. Normally, I check in code. Everything works fine. I've actually added a feature or something. That's a forward step. This, uh, where the smoke test fails is backwards because I've posed other parts of the system. Now, I'll say that. It's actually not necessarily my fault. So maybe because my code together with some other code that was checked in at just about the same time doesn't play together nicely and it just needs to be fixed. It's not, it's not necessarily me that's morally failed. It's just that it's just that it would be a backward step in the system given the rest of the code base and I have to fix it before you folks want to get it. So uh, a smoke test is a sanity check of a different sort. I like Jesse's comment there. But it's a sanity check of a different sort, ladies and gentlemen. It's a sanity check is, is my check into the system worth you folks getting and, and, and heading it off if it's not. Okay, so assertions, we talked about them. Their job, ladies and gentlemen, is to catch logical mistakes, developer mistakes. A good an assertion, we hope it will never be triggered. Right? We hope my, my assumptions are valid, that they're reasonable, they're correct. But if it is it, we want to know as soon as possible. It has language support in many languages. Java, for example, has an assertion statement to actually assert something. And a key thing is you can disable it without changing the code base. What do I mean by that? I can disable the assertion without changing the code base. Yeah, not only that, I actually don't need to remove anything. Like, I don't need to go to the .java file and strip the compiler. Yeah, I, can, I can just say to the compiler, hey, compile it without using assertions or the, the, the Java runtime. Ignore assertions, like disable them. In which case, they won't run. No, this is an important point. It's, it's not that they just don't print out. They don't run anymore. So you can actually do one of the, There's great uses of assertions. It's not just... It's not just is i greater than j, or is, you know, is i greater than or equal to zero and less than, or less than the line to the array. Those are good uses of assertions. I'd like to see them. But you can also do a high level thing. So you can say, like, is this, is my algorithm, like from our file, 360, you probably learned really clever algorithms to do certain types of tasks, right? Um, the certain types of tasks can be much faster with a good algorithm than a brute force algorithm. Where you search every possible combination. But maybe you code it up the clever algorithm and you want to be sure that it's working correctly. So you could actually assert in your code that the clever algorithm gives the same result as the brute force algorithm. Now you might say, that's crazy. Because then you're running brute force algorithm. I mean, why would you ever do that? It's going to take us long, more, longer time than even the brute force algorithm. The whole point is to run the quick row. But I'm saying we do that in our assertion. Why? Because then you just disable the assertion. You just say, hey, don't run it with this assertion in this module. And you can do that in Java. You can say, disable the assertion in this particular module. And then every time you run it with testing, it's actually confirming the brute force algorithm and the clever algorithm give the same results. Builds your confidence. The clever algorithm is correct. And then you just disable that assertion, and it doesn't run in the full code base. Right? So you've built great confidence, your clever algorithm works, and then you take it away, take the assertion away with no cost. The assertion is still in the code, it's just it, it doesn't run when, it's, when the code base is wrong. Does that make sense? So the point is you can use assertions to test higher level things really usefully. It's not just low level things. Okay. Um, incremental delivery. Why do we iterate? Why do we, when we create software in this class, and probably in 370 as well, you created software in a set of, of, of incremental deliverables. Sir, did you folks take 370 when Professor Duchin taught it or Professor Roy? Yeah. Professor Roy. Professor Roy, okay. Did he have you do um, um, sort of success in incrementally deliverables, or was it different assignments? It's milestones. Milestones, okay. Why do milestones? Why do, why do different incremental deliverables where you're, each 
one milestone and join to the next and giving the next and each time to one. Why do that? Why do, why do you do that? And so it allows to build, us to build our system in bite-sized pieces that we know what at least work or like kind of reasonable. Good. Okay. Yeah. That's the thing through what's actually going to work and and um and 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 again thanks for running a through right. So that's part of it. That's what what other things does it give us? It turns out it gives us a swap to benefit. What's another one? I mentioned it earlier, actually, one of them. Well, we can better estimate how long things will take. If we're thinking about how much can we build in a year, it's really easy to fool ourselves. You'd be way off. The joke when I was at MIT was you would, you would take your estimate, multiply it by three, add one, and you would shift it up to the next higher unit. So like if it was, if you estimated three days, you multiply it by three, nine days, add one, ten days, and then make it go from days to weeks. So, <laughs> ten weeks. <laughs> Sounds good, right? Um, the, the point is, it's really easy to fool ourselves if we're, if we're thinking in broad chunks, because we're not thinking concretely exactly what do I do on what day, what days am I available, what are the exact features to be done, how do they work together. If we're doing it in small chunks, we... Um, we reason concretely. Okay, so let me enumerate just a couple of things. One is um, we have easier estimates of tank past uh, Another thing is we actually can replan after each iteration what to do next. Like, what's the next highest priority? And we're delivering ongoing value. What do I mean by that? is that you can actually, for, for a good incremental deliverable, you can actually give it to the stakeholder. It gives some value. They get some features. They, they get some value. They can do something with the system. And so they get some, they get some value from it. They get some benefit from it. And you give them the next one, they get some more benefit. Give them the next one. They're getting benefit early. And this leads to stakeholder confidence. Like, yeah, this is actually going somewhere. This is actually getting something done. It's accomplishing something. That's really good. It helps give team morale as well. Like, okay, now we're at this point. Okay, it looks pretty good. I remember some of my earliest, I did some of my earliest professional software development in the uh, late 80s at Microsoft. Um, I knew a bunch of billionaires. <laughs> we were not going to work alongside them. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun for the development team in those early days. It worked on the Excel team, for example, and you get to see Excel getting its new features, you know, to run it along the way. It's good for morale. You get to see them in concrete ways. Very importantly, ladies and gentlemen, the stakeholder, this is something it took me many years to really fully realize. I hope to impart it to you before you leave this class. For, for stakeholders, especially those who are not computer scientists, who, who don't work every day with you know, lots and lots of information, it's hard for them to imagine a system which has the features they describe. It's hard for them to really think, what does it look like? How does it work? Because they're not used to really thinking about how these widgets in Android or iOS or web apps work. We, we see them every day. So we, somewhat more clarity about how they work together. But for a stakeholder, it's just not obvious what it would look like. And you show them something from an early deliverable. This is ID2, and you show it to them. They actually get a much better sense of, oh, that's what it's going to look like. Oh, no, I, I actually want this other thing. I want this, I, I wanted that on a different screen. Well, you can say, well, why didn't you tell me earlier? So you can think of what it would look like. You have to show it to them. They say, oh, oh, okay, yeah, I, you've got that almost right, but this thing I want differently. It helps them learn from something and come up with a better idea about their needs. The danger here is if you go a year, you get a description for the biggest, greatest system, and you go a year before you deliver it, they'll look at it and say, that, that, that's, not, that's not what I want. You know, it's, that, was, that isn't what I was thinking. Um, and a lot of the problem is they're not thinking about actually something too concrete, and they haven't had a chance to steer it along the way. It's just like, when
when we go to drive from here to Regina, if you, if you drive to Regina, or even if you were to walk home, you wouldn't walk home with your eyes closed. You have a really good idea of how you're going to get home. But you always need feedback from seeing things. And so it is like for the stakeholders. They want to see, like, as it comes along, and, oh, that isn't quite what I wanted. I wanted this other thing. Or, or they get better clarity of what to do next, right? It's like, oh, you hit that on the head. Now let's do this. Or, oh, I didn't think of doing it that way. Yeah, I really like that. Now that makes me think, yeah, we can also do this, this other way. So they learn along the way here, right? And you learn how much time does it take for certain tasks. You learn, oh, man, in, um, you know, express.js or angular.js, it's really quick to do this. Or this other thing, you know, requiring MongoDB took much longer than the top or, you know, to do this certain task, or or you know um, the the play framework is is really awkward for doing this thing, or or uh, Node.js is great, you know it allows us to do things. So for you, it allows you to to um, uh, to sort of figure out how how long ta uh, task tasks take, and you can also deal with risks. So. You may want to, in early deliverables, prioritize something, not because it's high value, but because it's risky. That may sound weird, but you do what you call, you build what you call as a spike prototype. Spike, the last spike. Prototype, meaning it's throwaway prototype. You focus on one issue, like does no.js play well with Spark? And you just create throwaway code that tests how do they work together and how would they accomplish a certain task. Throwaway code, you don't have to use that code, but you make sure they work together well. I mean, that's part of your deliverable. I view that as part of a good deliverable. You, you checked out a risk and you crossed it out. Because if you were to go later and you're using Node.js and Spark as your core technologies and it might be four and you can merge them together, you sure as heck benefit by knowing if they don't play together from the start. You want to resolve that risk. You want to put that risk to bed so you can head forward with confidence. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, okay. Um, oh, a final thing. This relates to things, a couple uh, stake, um, things, uh, things back. Often there's external changes. Stakeholder needs change or other changes. Sometimes their stakeholders, um, they change the, uh, you know, their organization changes. The bank you're working with to develop this system that's commissioning you to build this system merges with another bank. It's bought out. You know, there's a change in management structure, what have you. And, um, and because of that, the needs may change about what they need in the software. And if you're delivering it incrementally, each one, you can always, like for ID3, you, you could have the stakeholder tell you, you know, I was thinking these next two features would be the main priorities at this point. But because of the changes in the Saskatoon Health region, and now it's the Saskatoon Health Authority, I'm thinking now we want these two other features. They didn't anticipate at the beginning of the semester, but circumstances changed on their part. Something unexpected happened. They had an unexpected contact. They showed the system to one of their colleagues who had an idea for a great new feature. And you have the flexibility because you've delivered it incrementally to change path to do that. Does that make sense? Because it's incremental. If you did it for a full year, you would only hear that at the end of the year after the need, long after the needs had changed. Mm. So stakeholder need change is, is, is a big need. Okay. Um, final thing I'll mention here, continuous integration. We talked about this last time. The basic idea. I introduced the thing and I've come back to it. The basic idea is you want to have, ladies and gentlemen, builds going on as soon as you check things in. So as soon as you check things in to the repo, to the GitHub repo, you want a pipeline of operations called the build to take place. And it can allow for feedback as soon as possible if there's a problem with the check-in. Okay. Um, this also has a wide variety of benefits. 
But one of the big things that heads off is what used to be called in software the Big Bang. This is long before the sitcom series of the same thing. The idea was in older software, this is true especially in the 80s, sometimes in the early 90s, you'd have people working on different parts of a project, maybe for a month at a time, in many companies. And then they would basically check in their software. And it'd be a big bang. Things wouldn't work together. Things wouldn't even compile. There was a project at Microsoft called Microsoft Omega, which is basically access, Microsoft Access, but they didn't mean access. Although it was a failed project, so it was thrown away and went back and didn't distract for that access very well. And that project would it it went like six months to a year just with compiler errors. It couldn't even compile. It was horrible. It was horrible. I'm coming into work every day. What you, what's your jobs for today? We're going to more compiler, you know, more, more errors supported by the compiler. It's horrible. Isn't that, it's like, can you imagine them keeping the developers? Like, you've got to put them in a cage or something. Um, it's, it's horrible. So ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you, every time you check in, you get a build going on, why is it easier to resolve the errors? Well, if you're only changing a little bit each time before you check in, and some error comes up, you pretty much know what caused the error. If you're only changing five lines of code, and they, there's no error before, you check in, the five new lines of code, there's an error. You kind of know where to look for, for the cause of the error, right? Um, it's a lot easier to find what, what was the error. And, you're checking things in along the way, so you don't have this giant collision with a whole swack of changes checked in by someone else, and you've got a whole swack of changes. Instead, you're doing it a little bit. So if there are errors and incompatibilities, they'll be at a smaller scale rather than on thousands of lines of code from each of you, not playing together nicely. So incremental development helps for quicker identification of problems, greatly reduces integration headaches, my code colliding with yours in a horrible way that leads to hundreds of error messages. And you can actually build it and, and get out a more consistent typically. So, so if you get out something that's at least got some new features in it, it, it actually helps more out, once again. Um, and also it forces developers to fix bugs early, not just write more code. Man, I want to write more code today. No, you, you've got to fix these bugs before you write more code. <laughs> there are these bugs staring you in the face. you got to fix them. Don't go a month just writing code and then checking it out. Man. No, each day with this mixture of bug fixing or, or, or error compiler error fixing and, and writing new code. So it, it helps both ways. Okay, so the build pipeline is going to include building from scratch, compiling, maybe integrating with the database, running tests, running some software inspections, and then um, deploying, deploying software. Deploying it out to a build, to a, um, say, a, a production machine or a, a development machine. And you'll typically have a script that specifies these different, um, different steps in a build pipeline like on, um, on um, GitHub. Okay, um, I don't have time to go for more than this other than to note that the smoke test is the way associated with this build where you run tests, you're running a broad set of tests that are going to test, is the system basically sane? Is it working? Is it going to, is there anything so broken we gotta roll back this latest check-in that triggered this build? Okay, that's all we have time for today. I appreciate your patience. I will have office hours now if any of you wanna talk with me. And um, I would ask, Remember next time, Sphinx S341. Secondly, remember next time that um, over the weekend, I'm hoping by Sunday you could let me know which project you're choosing, barring that. Um, at the latest, we should speak on, on Tuesday uh, to resolve this because we'll need to work with stakeholders and with myself to get you going as soon as possible with the requisite technologies. I would like on Tuesday to be able to come in here and recommend some technologies for you, recommend some testing frameworks, 
recommend some ways of, of, uh, of getting a whole, sweat, a whole uh, platform of technology, stack of technologies. So if you could let me know what you're thinking over the weekend and assigned positions, that would be great. If you need to consult with me, I'm available now.